Good afternoon. Thanks to everyone for coming. So um, I'll uh, introduce our speaker today. I don't think we need a mic for a small group, but oh, they're recording it. Uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Menon. Uh, Ajit Menon is associate professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. He works on the political economy of natural resource conflict and political ecology. Um, his work, his research is aimed at understanding how and when the environment becomes important, as well as contestations, both material and ontological, that underlie conflicts over the environment in general and commons, in the commons in particular. He's worked a lot on forested landscapes across South India, and he's just uh, brought out a co-edited volume uh, on uh, forest governance, which is called Democratizing Forest Governance in India. Uh, but he's also now recently started working on the political ecology of the fisheries and has been doing this work that he'll be presenting today on the conflict in the uh, Park Bay area. And uh, a lot of his work, he's also worked on coastal zone management and uh, that's another kind of area of work which I have personally found very interesting uh, and influential. So there's a number of areas to do with environment and environmental governance that uh, Ajit Menon works on and one of these I guess he'll be talking about today. Thanks, Thanks uh, Parna. Uh, before I talk about this particular issue, I should say as you can see that this is you know, collaborative work so I should recognize my co-authors here. Martin has worked on Coromandel Coast fisheries for a long time. Johnny is a student we've co-guided. He just submitted his PhD on Rameshwaram and Mandapam trawling fishing and the sort of spatial uh, politics of their fishing practices. And Mani Mohan actually works with me. He lives near Rameshwaram in Tangachimatam, which is a fishing village on the peninsula. So this is a collaborative effort. I just happen to be the one uh, that's presenting it, who's presenting it. Uh, for you, I mean, I guess many of you are probably all of you are familiar with the basic question, but in case, in case you're not, this is the Pork Bay. So the Pork Bay is uh, a body of water that separates India and Sri Lanka. And what we essentially call a, fi a fishing crisis is the fact that that line in the middle, which is the International Maritime Boundary Line, which was designated in 1974, has seen Indian trawlers from nine centers uh, those are the centers on the Indian side, from Malipatnam in Tanjavur to Rameshwaram in, Rameshra, in Ramna district, essentially crossing over uh, the international maritime boundary line. And that has become, has always been an issue, but it's probably become more of an issue post the end of the civil war in uh, Sri Lanka, post-2009. So we call it a crisis because it's, it's not a, a live conflict all the time. I mean, the conflicts come and go, but the crisis which is both social and ecological sort of remains there. It's, it's an ecological crisis because of the fact that there are almost 2,000 trawlers uh, which, who fish uh, in the Pork Bay in these nine centers, and that's excluding fishers from Nagapatnam here in, in the north who often cross over to the, you know, to the eastern side of Sri Lanka and parts of the Pork Bay as well. So those numbers are not accounted for because Nagapatnam has been a little, it's a little bit more complicated so we haven't really looked at Nagapatnam very carefully in this whole equation. And of course the social crisis, there are multiple crises. I mean from the Sri Lankan side, fishers coming back to fish after the war. But of course there's the bigger question of you know, post-war, 29 years of a, a, a war, which has not only had a historical impact, but obviously continues to have an impact. Uh, things might or might not be changing post recent elections, but the, for example, there are high security zones which continue to sort of dot the north, northern province landscape. There is the question of uh, whether or not there is a deliberate attempt to move uh, Sinhalese people into the north so as to change the dem demography and so on. So there are a series of social questions on the Sri Lankan side. But there's also, I mean, uh, on the Indian side, trawlers, whether we like them or not, they're also largely uh, trawling because of uh, livelihood reasons, at least many of them. We'll get into the particulars later. And so for them, with this crisis escalating, if they're unable to fish, that, that adversely affects them. So that's essentially the, the, the crisis that I want to try to understand or we're trying to understand just for in case, you know, I mean, those are the trawlers. So if you go to Rameshram, you'll see about a thousand of those trawlers berthed. 
And you know, these are the Sri Lankan boats. We should also just say at the outset that there is a ban on trawling in Sri Lanka. So except for the multi-day boats, which are the bigger vessels in the south southern part of the country, which tend to fish for tuna, they don't fish in this area by and large. We have fiberglass boats, which you also have on the Indian side, but these are the only boats. So it's really a mismatch of technology. Trawlers use bottom net technology, which means they basically drag their, drag their nets, which is dis uh, destructive ecologically as well, because it just, in, I mean, the target species is shrimp, but you catch a whole bunch of other things as well. So the main aim when we started this paper, which has been going on for God knows how long now, but a long period of time, uh, writing and rewriting and so on, the main objective has to provide a sort of more nuanced and historically grounded analysis of this fisheries crisis. Being situated in Tamil Nadu, I think uh, one of our aims was also to try to put out a, a sort of different type of perspective than the one that tends to be covered mostly in the mainstream press and more so in the Tamil press, which is that of the Sri Lankan Navy, human rights, which of course are, are important issues, but there are also other issues. I mean, the, the discussion of Indian trawlers largely, except for Meera Srinivasan's writing in the Hindu, are not so much covered in the, in the, in the Tamil language press. So that's what we, one of our objectives. The other, which is sort of a wider academic concern that we're interested in, which I'll, you know, I won't get into huge detail here, but is the question of capital accumulation. What is actually happening in terms of uh, this crisis. Why, why is capital accumulation uh, the, an interesting theoretical or conceptual way to look at this question? There are other ways to look at this problem. For example, you could use the sort of institutional approach, tragedy of the commons. They treat this as a common property problem, free rider problem. Uh, that, we feel, doesn't explain it enough because uh, unless you look at the scale of the problem, you could have many boats and still not have a tragedy. I mean, it, it, it is about the scale of fishing, which is really the important uh, dimension to this problem. Similarly, therefore, a Malthusian perspective, though numbers are important, fishers fishing with, if you had 2,000 fiberglass boats, it would not necessarily be a problem. But it is the scale and, uh, of, of these trawlers and the size of these trawlers, which is uh, part of the problem. So we're situating this in this wider question of capital accumulation, which some amount of political ecology literature is increasingly starting to uh, conceptualize these type of issues in, in a similar way. And the final thing is this, is this spatial component, because the spatial component is important because obviously in terms of where do people go to accumulate, okay? And, and since this is a transboundary problem, we're interested in knowing where they go, because we should also not a priori just assume that all trawlers are going to Sri Lanka, because that would also not be factually correct. So the, the, the spatial part of what Harvey calls the, you know, the spatial fix is, is in a sense a mapping exercise of trying to see where these boats go, who's crossing, how do people deal with this intra-boundary intra uh, problem. And we try to do that by bringing in these other factors. Conflict between artisanal and trawling, trawler fishers in India, uh, the question of ethnicity linked, of course, to the civil war, but also the wider geopolitics of ethnicity in the area. And then post-war, uh, 2009, this idea that the nation state uh, is becoming more important in terms of how fishers deal with problems. I'll, I'll explain that in more detail later. So these are the broad objectives. Now, yeah, this, you know, there is a literature. Obviously, we're not you know, the first people to work on trawling and uh, there's quite a bit written about it on the Karaman, on the East Coast, more so on the East Coast, a little bit in, in Kanyakumari, Aparna's work, Ajanta Subramanya's work, Martin's work, which has looked at trawling uh, to some extent. The, probably the primary research question which has driven that research is, is different in the sense that they've looked at it more vis-a-vis -vis artisanal fishers and potential conflicts between artisanal fishers when trawling becomes a more important uh, way of fishing when mechanization takes place. So much of the literature is looking at the Blue Revolution and the consequences in some way of the Blue Revolution, which was basically the mechanization of the fisheries in order to target largely shrimp, and what they call the pink gold rush. That was basically the main aim of uh, the Blue, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So, so you know that we use 
that non-economists also use some type of methodologies. We've actually uh, tried to do a number of things here. We've, uh, we've, we've taken four trawling centers and tried to speak to owners of boats and crew members. The basic idea really is to get an idea as to what has been happening, temporarily speaking, in terms of the fishing industry. Is it just a process of, you know, the sort of Marxist perspective of a concentration of capital that is taking place and a shrinking size of trawlers who are accounting for that or not? So we spoke to about, uh, you know, 145 owners in these four centers in, in the north and the south of the Pork Bay to get an idea as to what they've been doing for a period of time to see whether they've just entered and then, you know, accumulated over time or whether some have entered and exited and so on. And we've also spoken to crew members because crew members are becoming increasingly important in the context of arrests across the border. It is the crew that often are the most reluctant to get onto these boats when uh, the Sri Lankan Navy decides to enforce the maritime boundary line. And we also, as part of other research that we've been doing, we've done what we call a beach walk. So we've actually walked this whole area and so also gone to all the artisanal villages in order to see about their histories, the issues that are important to them in the context of artisanal trawler rivalries. And then we've kept track of the sort of media uh, happenings, uh, Tamil and English press over the last five, six years, and also historically in trying to situate this, especially the question of ethnicity and geopolitics, uh, locate the fishing crisis in, in that situation. So let me start with the, what is, the, I guess, the meat of the paper. Now, we know that the basic story is what? In the 1950s and late, early 60s, the state in India, like in many other sectors, decides to promote fisheries. And the main aim of trying to promote fisheries, the, the justification was twofold. One was, of course, as a source of protein for fishers themselves. It, was, it wasn't only about exports at the start, at least. It was about improving the livelihoods of the fisher population. And the second was the, the export, uh, the, the whole export emphasis and seeing fisheries as a, pos a possible major export earner. And so you had the state investing in technologies, in developing boats, in infrastructure, in ice factories, and a whole bunch of infrastructure along most of the coast where fisheries was significant. In addition to that, in this particular area, you also had a lot of new private capital moving in. Rameshram, this, the Pork Bay area in the 1940s and 50s was largely, uh, you know, the extent of fishing was much less than it, than it is today. A lot of people moved in when incentives were given to invest in the fisheries. So there is, of course, this big debate. Some people argue that most of the owners of trawlers in, in the Pork Bay are non-fishers, but don't think that is actually completely accurate. I think one would be a, a sort of 50-50 split of new people moving into the fisheries and people, in a sense, upgrading, which was the intention of state policy. Artisanal fishers moving up and becoming trawlers. So you had this growth, and you had an increase in exports. And also, if you look at the data, you will see that now uh, trawling, shrimp which is caught from, from trawlers is increasingly accounting for more and more of the overall catch in terms of vis-a-vis -vis artisanal. What, the other thing you will see now, if you look at data, is that the, the aquaculture sector is increasingly making inroads in terms of the contribution to total shrimp catch. So we call this, uh, you know, borrowing from Marsden, who's worked on Cambodian fisheries, a circulatory process of accumulation. There are many people who have been entering fishers and the, in, entering fisheries and then exiting. There have been crew members who have upgraded and become owners. There have been accountants on boats who have also upgraded. There are people who have exited both because they've been economically unable to sustain or they're, they're boat owners who have become traders and have moved up the value chain. So the process of accumulation, which of course is empirically very difficult to, uh, to figure out really because if you need to speak to individual owners, they're not, it's, it's difficult to get this type of information about returns, and especially in a climate which is relatively, I mean, pretty depressing really for owners and crew. You don't really want not very happy talking to researchers for huge periods of time when they feel their lives are, you know, crumbling in front of them. So, but the general uh, situation we see, therefore, is a circulatory process of accumulation, but accumulation overall, one could say, is happening, at least in terms of output. So, you know, the, the export market is also, it continues to grow. 
and come back to why that might be the case, even in, in a situation of crisis. So this is the, the impetus in a sense. It was the blue revolution from the 60s onwards. Now the argument that we try to make in the paper is that if you, is that while the blue revolution explains the process of accumulation, it doesn't explain adequately the dynamics of this accumulation over time. And so the, the first other issue that we looked at is the question of artisanal versus trawler fishers. Now, artisanal fishers have always been, at least from the late 60s, 70s, have been active in Tamil Nadu. And you know, people always say with MGR coming to power in the early 70s, uh, AAIDMK being more close to the fishing community, art artisanal activism became stronger in Tamil Nadu in the 70s, and others have documented this in, in Kerala with the, with the advent of the National Fish Workers Forum and in other parts of India as well. So what you see happening in terms of artisanal activism in, in this particular location is that artisanal fishers are obviously worried about trawlers because there's a mismatch of technology. And trawlers having these bottom nets which basically drag also can end up destroying the, the nets of artisanal fishers. So artisanal activism in the 70s is basically aimed at trying to come up with some type of a framework in which trawlers are to function. So in this particular area in Pudakote, in, which is the second district in that map, if, in case you're not familiar with the, so yeah, so Pudakote will be these two centers, Jagadipatnam and Kotepatnam, that's Pudakote. Activism starts in, in the 70s and uh, led largely by the, the, the trade union wing of the CPI and it results in similar activism following suit later in Tanjavur and then in Ramnad much later in the early 1990s. Our, our basic explanation as to why artisanal activism is, takes place much later in Ramnad is because of the strength of, of, the, of boat associations, trawler associations are much stronger in Ramnad district than they are in the other district, possibly at least giving partial explanation as to why artisanal activism has less of an impact in that district. But what happens basically is because of this activism, uh, rules are formulated in the Pork Bay. So this thing that we, I call, we call the, is called the three, four day rule is essentially the outcome of activism, which me, this rule uh, essentially says that trawlers are only allowed to go and fish three days a week. So if you go to Ram, Rameshwaram and you, on Monday morning, Wednesday morning or Saturday morning, trawlers set off, they come back 24 hours later. The other four days are supposed to be for artisanal fishers. The logic, of course, being that then trawlers will not interfere with artisanal fishing. Now, this, is, this was one of the outcomes, though the state has accepted this, and it is part, of, it's a, there is a government order also, it actually emerged from civil society. The, the next thing that happens, is, which is in 1983, is this Tamil Nadu Marine Fisheries Regulation Act, which is similar to other acts in other states which talks about this three nautical mile rule, which is that trawlers are not supposed to go and fish close to the coast. They're supposed to fish three nautical miles and beyond. Because again, one of the problems is that the continental shelf area is a rich area for shrimp. So trawlers tend to venture into this area and that then affects artisanal fishers. So this is another legislative outcome which is, which in a sense limits the, the space that trawlers have in that small area to fish because of the activism of the artisanal sector. Now, if you go back nine years, earlier than 83 and 74, is when this international maritime boundary line is designated. Now, there's a long history, I won't get into too much detail about it, but this is when Indira Gandhi is, in, is Prime Minister of India, and this is when Kachitiva, which is the issue you will probably read about a lot, the island of Kachitiva is handed over to Sri Lanka when Indira Gandhi uh, is Prime Minister. The, the argument we make in the, in the paper is that Indira Gandhi has her hands full. There's already the Bangladesh conflict of 71 has taken place. There is some amount of unrest in the Northeast. And, sh and basically, uh, Indira Gandhi doesn't want to have another, another you know, major uh, issue on her hands. So essentially hands over uh, Kachitiva to Sri Lanka. And of course, that debate is still alive. If you come to Tamil Nadu, you'll hear it almost every day. And if you present this in Tamil Nadu, the first question people will ask you is, what happens, what about Kachitiva? Okay, so Kachitiva is handed over as part of this 1974-76 agreements that take place. So these three legislative 
moments or lo these laws basically impede the ability of trawlers, these 2,000 trawlers, to fish in this area. And hence, spatially, in terms of practice, they start crossing over the border. So the argument being that while the, the artisanal fishers see this as a good thing, the consequence of, of, of this, these laws is that the problem, in a sense, has been shifted across the border. And that problem manifests itself much later, because at this point of time, as I'll explain next, there's no one really fishing on the Sri Lankan side, because it's when the war is about, you know, it's before the war, and there's some amount of fishing, but then the war breaks out, and so on. So the, the artisanal trawler conflict has a significant impact in terms of the spatial practices of trawlers. Now, the other major question, of course, is, is the big question, really, in Tamil Nadu, that of ethnicity. Now, if you know your broad history of Sri Lanka, then you'll know that in 1940s, this ethnic question becomes a major question, There's all, both in the north, but also in terms of the estate Tamils. There's, you have two sets of Tamils in, in Sri Lanka, the northern Tamils and those who went in the 19th century to work largely on plantations. And in the 1940s, already this question of citizenship for estate Tamils is becoming a problem. Essentially, a citizenship is not being granted. So discussions about what to do with these lakhs of workers who have gone 100 years earlier to work in tea estates, how is this going to be solved, is already on the table in the 1940s. Added to that are these other things, this whole question of uh, Sinhalese being de declared as, as the official language, Somewhat later, Buddhism being declared as the, as, the, as the main religion in Sri Lanka. And there is a sense of alienation that is felt, I think, in general by the Tamil population uh, in, in Sri Lanka. And this has, we argue, an impact on, in terms of how this conflict plays itself out. So in terms of the conflict, now given the fact that this ethnic tension has, is brewing by the 1970s, the 1970s to sort of 83, which is the period prior to the war, uh, there you don't hear much about arrests of boats crossing over. I think boats have started to cross over at this time. The, 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 the large growth of trawlers is in the 70s and 80s and beyond. But there is a sense that in the 70s, this is this has not become such a big problem as uh, as it as it as it is to become a little bit later. So you have. Uh, relatively free access to Sri Lankan waters despite this international maritime bo uh, uh, boundary line. Neither government seems to be particularly worried about enforcing this boundary line. Now, in 83 is after, of course, many years of, 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 of simmering conflict, the, the, the war breaks out with the tigers in Sri Lanka. And we were trying to understand how does this affect the war, uh, the fishing question, really, because on the one hand, obviously, ethnicity the ethnic situation becomes much more polarized in the 80s. I mean, feelings are, are running very high, I think, in, on both sides of the international boundary line. But what we try to suggest is that because the Sri Lankan government has its high, hands full with the civil war, and at this point also the sea tigers, their ability to monitor this boundary line is, is relatively weak. And this is happening at the same time that boat numbers are increasing. Okay, so you have more and more boats coming, and they start crossing the maritime boundary line. So the ethnic conflict, in a sense, facilitates the ability of trawlers to go across the maritime boundary line, though the human costs, of course, start to increase. Because the Sri Lankan Navy, during this period, starts to target uh, fishing boats. And you, know, you can read that in, in whatever way you want to read it. I mean, on the Tamil, on Tamil Nadu side, they'll see that as excessive force. If, the other perspective is that the tigers are also using the, the fishing community to further their struggle, and therefore, uh, you know, fishing boats are legitimate targets of the Sri Lankan Navy. But anyway, the targeting of fishing boats increases in the 70s and 80s, and there are a number of deaths that, that take place. But ethnicity, to jump a little bit forward, ethnicity remains important throughout the course of, of the war. I was, Telling a partner before the uh, before the uh, this talk that the extent of this commonness between Tamils in the north, Tamils in the rest of Sri Lanka, and Tamils in Tamil Nadu is something that historically I feel still needs to be researched much more closely. But there is 
I think still some amount of linkages and contacts which were there historically. And there has always been, and I think until recently at least, continues to be some amount of goodwill between Sri Lankan fishers and Indian fishers, uh, even post-war. So in 2004, when this problem really starts to escalate, okay, there's a ceasefire in the war for a couple of years, and there are talks that take place between civil society groups on both sides of the border, in India and in Sri Lanka. Um, these break down because the conflict resumes a couple of years later and there's no atmosphere for further talks. But after the war in 2009, there is another initiative. Uh, fishers come from Sri Lanka to meet their Indian counterparts, trawler owners, in Tamil Nadu in 2010 in Trichy. And the fact that they come suggests to us that there is this amount, there is, they understand at some level the plight of the Indian trawler also. That just saying stop trawling is not a solution for people who depend on trawling for their livelihood. So there are these discussions that take place. But when they come to India, I think they're, they themselves are a little bit surprised to the extent of this problem. And so, because they, they go to Rameshwaram, they see these thousands of boats there, and they realize that there's absolutely no way with if all these boats go and fish in Sri Lankan waters, and these boats go as close to one kilometer to the Sri Lankan coast, there's no way they can fish. So though there is a tentative agreement reached in 2010, the agreement basically says that trawlers should fish maximum for 70 days for the next year, and that after a year, trawling should stop. And that is what is signed on to. The problem is Indian trawlers just cannot, they cannot stick to this agreement. I mean, th there have been talks on the Indian side about buyback schemes, which I'll talk about a little bit more, about going for deep sea fishing and so on. But unless these solutions are on the table, it's fine to say we'll only fish 70 days. But, and even though 70 days are sometimes problematic because people are getting arrested. It's not risk-free fishing. So 70 days might become 50 days. Indian fishers are unable to keep to this agreement. They continue to fish. So ethnicity, we argue, in, in, in the last major sort of part of the paper, starts to uh, play sort of second fiddle to the nation state. And we, and we use the nation state here in a very limited limited sense, you know, the nation state as a political entity, not a Benedict Anderson sort of idea of the imagined nation. Okay, we're talking about people who uh, start looking to the nation state more to solve this problem because the problem is becoming so bad now. So on the Sri Lankan side in 2009, when they start going back fishing, you have to realize it's 27 years of war. Uh, the whole area is devastated. I mean, and in addition to that, you have all these high security zones. Rajapaksha is still in power in that point of time. So you know, security is a, is a paramount issue. In addition to that, they have to then confront who they thought were their Tamil brothers fishing in the same area. So that, that sentiment you know, fiddle, fizzles away a little bit, at least in terms of the day-to-day -day practicals, uh, pra you know, the practice of going fishing. Then the positions become much more hardened. So if you start reading the press in, the, in 2009, 2010, you hear about you know, protests outside the Indian High Commission in Sri Lanka, you hear about Indian boats being captured by Sri Lankan fishers, you, are, you hear about the Sri Lankan fishers uh, asking the Sri Lankan government to enforce the international maritime boundary line because this is Sri Lankan waters, a language that they really haven't spoken before at all. So, and even on the Indian side, you see a whole bunch of different things happening. You, uh, on the, from the Indian government point of view, you have to realize in a federal structure, you have the state government saying one thing, and the state government obviously is much more attached to the aspirations of, of, of Tamil fishers in the center. But the center is starting to realize that this is really an Indian problem. If you really want to address this question, you need to address the trawling problem. So they start talking about you know, Indian trawlers shouldn't really cross the maritime boundary line, or at least they shouldn't go five nautical miles from the coast. They make public statements about this. They even go to the courts to try to enforce uh, the, the IMBL and so on. So the sentiment is changing in India also. And though Tamil Nadu, of course, and Jay Lalita sort of goes on a slightly different track by continuing to raise the Kachativa issue and actually impleding the Tamil Nadu government in the Kachativa case, which there is still a case which is sitting in the courts about Kachativa and the legitimacy of that initial transfer to Sri Lanka. But the general uh, situation now is 
that the nation state becomes much more significant. Even this fissure to fissure dialogue you might have read yesterday or day before, again, there were discussions in Chennai about uh, cutting back and apparently now there's some new agreement on the table about Indian fishers can fish 83 days for the next year, but then they have apparently promised to stop fishing after three years. Now, whether that happens, I don't know, we'll have to see, but that is apparently the, the latest development as of two days ago. But even these discussions have now been taken over by the governments. You know, it started as a fisher to fisher dialogue. Governments were supposed to just support it, but they weren't supposed to drive it, but that, that has changed. So the problem now has become, in, in some sense, a little bit more complicated, though ethnicity continues to be an important issue. It is now in the realm of geopolitics and, the, and, and bilateral relationships. So this is just a summary of, uh, I don't know, a bit of time, five minutes, yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the situation now, if you go to Rameshram, is that fishers, trawlers, are much more hesitant to cross the international maritime boundary line. This has been sort of the situation for the last one or two years. Okay, you will see a lot of trawlers actually tending to try to go more north from Rameshram so that they, if possible, can avoid crossing, going east and crossing the border. Problem with that is that if you go north, then you have the boats from the other centers fishing. So you, there is a reduction in the amount of trawling. At least two or three times when I've been in the field, there have been crew members have just refused to go on boats, saying that the risks are too high. Because in the last few days of the Rajapaksha government, the, the policy of the Sri Lankan Navy was to confiscate boats so as to, in a sense, target the owners uh, more and make the costs of fishing uh, much more high, higher than they were. So, so you, some owners are una unable to send boats out because of this. The other thing you've seen happening over the last four few years is this investment in bigger boats. So what we're known as Tutukudi boats. Tutukudi is in the southern, southeastern part of Tamil Nadu. These are bigger boats with Chinese engines, larger horsepower. Logic being to get over, go across the border and get back quicker. You know, so that the chances of being caught are less. Now, obviously, only some people can invest in that type of technology. So the, the, the processes of those who can, can survive this sort of uh, assertive uh, uh, implementation of the borderline, our observations are that some people are able to invest in, in better technology, bigger boats, so that they can manage this problem slightly better. Others just drop out. They're not able to, smaller boats are not able to, uh, you know, the smaller owners are not able to make those types of investments and so on. The other thing which I didn't, I should have said more is, one should also know that the, the, the large part of the problem is the southern part of the Pork Bay. The smaller boats in the north don't tend to cross the border as much, you know, because there's a larger area in the northern part, about 45 kilometers to the international maritime boundary line. So there has been some amount of concentration of capital over the last few years. Now, over, during these discussions, civil society discussions, one of the things that was tabled on the Indian side was this idea of a buyback. Now, what is a buyback? A buyback simply means you go to trawler owners and ask them whether they're willing to get out of the fisheries. And you have, a, the government has a package in which they, you know, 10 lakh package or 20 lakh package that has to be figured out. Pays the fishers and says, okay, you exit the fisheries. So that was being talked about and it's, it continues to be talked about in the same breath as this whole idea about going for deep sea fishing. The question, of course, remains as to what would happen if you have a buyback type of a policy. And I don't know, our initial feeling is that this could possibly lead to some form of an enclosure, even on the Indian side. The people who would exit would tend to be the smaller fishers who can't compete. The ones who remain would tend to be the, you know, the bigger boats owners and so on. And now with this recent Meena Kumari report, which has started to talk about opening up the exclusive economic zone, that is from 12 nautical miles to 200 nautical miles to foreign boats, it's unclear as to how trawler owners are going to fit into that type of a scenario. Because if they have to compete with you know, international boats, uh, it's, it would be extremely difficult. I think the other question which remains somewhat unanswered is if you speak, of course, it's very difficult to speak to seafood companies because they won't tell you very much. But uh, if you do get to speak to them, you will see that they don't seem to be in any form of crisis. I mean, you know, the, the, the growth of the seafood industry continues, which means 
that this type of concentration is probably still happening at the level of the company. You know, these, in the Indian context, mostly I think seafood companies, they don't have their own boats generally. They tend to buy directly from fishers. So if there's a problem in the pork bay, they will just most likely go and get their supply elsewhere. So solving the pork bay question doesn't necessarily uh, mean that one can, you know, you might just be moving the problem in a sense to, a, to another area. So just, you know, in concluding thoughts, and then maybe we can discuss some of this, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious, but uh, you know, it's, it's uncertain because geopolitics is uncertain, right? I, there's a new government in Sri Lanka. The general feeling from those we're working with in the north, they see this as some type of an opportunity. I mean, there, there are different opinions, of course, about the Sri Lanka elections, but I think the fact that a lot of people went out to vote in the north seems to suggest that the Tamil population in the north wanted Rajapaksha out. Of course, the, the diaspora community has tended to dismiss these elections, but there is expectation, I think, in the north to, uh, that there will be some changes with the Sirisena government and that they might open up talks. The other question is about the, the TNA, which is the main political disposition in the north. One of the critiques of the TNA is that they're largely, their support base is amongst the Velala agrarian community and not the Kariyar fishing community. So they've tended to be relatively silent on this issue. But yesterday and day before yesterday, they, it, they are articulating. It's not that they're not talking about this anymore. Even when Vigneshwar came to Chennai and spoke a few months ago, he did talk about this issue and the need to deal with the Indian uh, trawling situation. But of course, you know, it can go different directions is, is our assessment. And as I've already said, uh, on the Indian side, it really depends on what these alternative options are there for, fi for fishers. I mean, my own analysis is that we don't have a very good track record when it comes to rehabilitation, you know, whether it's in forests or fisheries or anything. So unless you see something that is really tangible, I don't know why fishers would, would exit unless the economics is so bad. You know, because alternatives are, are, are limited. And of course, then there's the vexing question of the Tamil Nadu government and Jay Lalita. Uh, Kachitiva seems to be still very much what drives Tamil Nadu politics in terms of, of, of this particular issue. And of course, the wider question of, of human rights uh, in Sri Lanka, which is an extremely important question. But uh, it might mean that finding some type of a compromise on this particular issue remains uh, extremely difficult. I think I'll stop there and maybe we can discuss that. Thanks. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you, you talked about this Kachativu problem. Leaving this politics aside, right. what are the advantage uh, India has, or you know, Tamil Nadu fishers has, if the Kachativu is going to be part of India? Right. Yeah, I, I don't actually. I'll just put up the Kachativu. Kachativu is, I think, somewhere over here. It's just across the international maritime boundary line. It's not very far into Sri Lankan waters, so. And the trawling thing is, you know, there are trawlers moving all over here. The trawlers going here, the trawlers going here. So normally the conflicts in the north will be the Tanjavur or the Nagapatnam boats. And the problems in Mana are from Rameshram. So Rameshram boats fish here. I mean, basically people fish as close as they can fish because it's expensive. You know, they, they get 1,500 liters of subsidy per month and then everything else has to be bought. So I don't, we don't feel that Kachativa is a big issue for fishing because it's not going to address that bigger question. Even if they can come and just fish in, in this area, it's not, 2,000 boats can't do that. It, it, it's impossible. So I don't think from a fishing perspective, Kachativa is a, is a solution. Today, Kachativa is basically only in you know, the St. Anthony's Festival. People go there for that festival and they go back. Otherwise, it doesn't really serve any other major uh, functional purpose as such. So I don't think Kachativa can solve this uh, is a solution to a fishing question. 
one more thing. Uh, if the, if Kachatiyu become part, part of India, what is the change in the boundary line? Like, will there be a significant change in the uh, maritime uh, boundary line? Or uh, I, 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 I feel like telling you you should ask Jay Lalita, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I pr presumably, if the island is here, then they have to, you'll have to re redo the border line. I mean, I can't unless you have an arrangement where you know you have access. This is the other thing that was talked about. Where could you have some type of a lease? You know, where people have lease rights to fish or access, which are not ownership rights. And in, in that type of a situation, maybe you don't have to redraw the maritime boundary line. But I can't see that happening. I mean, and the, the Sri Lankan position is hardening. I mean, even the Sirisena government, you know, they, I don't think uh, they are. And you know, it's a wider politics. The Chinese are investing in Sri Lanka. India is one actor. They don't, you know, India is not the end of the world necessarily for Sri Lanka. So I think I don't see the position changing in terms of the Sri Lankan government. So, and then again, you know, even if Tamil Nadu wants it, what is India's position on this? See, because then is that, that federal relationship. Uh, Indira Gandhi never thought it was important in the first place. He never talked to that. That is the major, I think, grievance in Tamil Nadu, that no one actually discussed this in Tamil Nadu before it was given away. Hi, Yachit. Thank you. Um, there's a very interesting uh, thing going on here about the trawlers and accumulation of capital. And there's a relationship between the choice of technology and accumulation of capital, right? Uh, but you also, there's a trend that, there's a, that uh, trawlers have been banned in Sri Lanka, and, but they're not banned. Uh, there are 2,000 trawlers on the Indian side. Is that a cap on the number of trawlers? No, now, in the last few years, there are no more licenses being given, given out. Okay. Okay, so how have the two different countries managed to kind of cap their respective or contain their respective capitals, if you See, will? I don't know about the history of multi-day boats if you go further south. They go all over the place. Like the other day we read something, even Kerala fishers the other day were arrested in South Africa. You know, people are going way out and fishing. So uh, multi-day boats, I think, go long distances and fish. I don't know the history of how trawling was actually banned in Sri Lanka. But you know, the multi-day boats are big boats, but they don't use, they're long liners. They, they catch tuna largely. So that's, that's a different technology. The, the, it, it's, a, it's a technology of the trawlers more than any, the size per se. Of course, the numbers in such a small area is a problem. But it is this net that, I mean, if you go see it, you know, they just drags the whole seabed. And, and if you go to the Rameshwaram coast, the shrimp is a very small percentage of the actual catch. You know, a lot of it goes to the poultry industry as waste and so on. So, yeah, I don't know, but there's no cap on the, there's a cap now in terms of issuing licenses, but there is this interesting thing of uh, ex trading of licenses. You know, like boats will be broken down, but the licenses remain in circulation. You know, so sometimes those licenses are used with other boats. Sometimes they're just used to get the benefits of, let's say, kerosene, because you get like 1,500 liters of kerosene. Uh, per, uh, no, sorry, diesel per, per month uh, to fish. So you don't see a ban on the Indian side coming through that on trawlers, not. Uh... Well, this is what uh, like civil society groups are asking for in a sense that trawling is is stopped. Whether the government does it, it's what civil society groups are calling for. I don't know in other parts of the country where areas are much larger. You see, this is sort of a unique type situation, because there are trawlers in many other parts also. I don't know if that answered your question. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to get how the two sides have managed to keep their trawlers in check. Yeah, in, the, in that sense, there was no real keeping tra tra you know, trawlers in check. I think the outcome loc is more of a local outcome because of the nature of the problem. You know, all of the legal instruments being used in the Pork Bay, which have now sort of been adopted by the government of Tamil Nadu, really emerged outside of the state in a sense. I mean, you know, and the state then, I mean, Martin has written about this in, in different ways about how the state actually takes up, you know, customary law and makes it statutory law in a sense. So the origins of it are not really the state. I think I'm not, I wouldn't expect the state to be the driver, though this Pork Bay platform now is being run through the fisheries department. Uh, 
uh, we we had an opportunity actually uh, last year to be along the coast so we interacted with a few people so uh, so what my take was to just to understand that from a trolling whatever is the income how is that getting distributed so in terms of capital accumulation so we found a very very different model which is followed there it is not a you know something like a capital model or a labor model because there is an incentive involved even for the crew yeah. on the on the catch which is coming so they have also a fixed plus variable sort of yeah. uh, uh, incentive which is whereas the boat owner typically gets only a fixed amount back so it is not that if he catch more there is a possibility that the boat owner gets more yeah. so where exactly were you able to locate the accumulation of this capital right. you know we yes. have some understanding, but I, th I thought I'll, I'll ask you before yeah. you know I share right. what my limit. See, as I understand it, in the Park Bay, there are two types of what we call broadly sharing systems. One is like which is more in operation in Rameshwaram, which is largely uh, a wage. So a wage would be like 700 rupees. Okay, it, 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 even within the crew, like the driver gets let's say 700. The second driver, if there's a backup driver, will get 600. What they call luxer, the crew gets less. Okay, so that's largely a wage thing. But even in the wage thing, there is what they call beta and kara beta. Now, so they you get a percentage. Again, the percentage varies according to the to the to the person. The other system, again, I think these terminologies are also not very. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with them because it's what they call the shared system. Now, what is the shared system? The shared system is you know, either the costs are met by the owner first, and then the rest is distributed according to the most common thing in the park pay is 80-20 now. 80% okay, goes to the owner, 20% goes to the crew, okay, after, after the costs have been met by the owner. Okay, so, so that's the, my understanding of the, system, of, of the sharing system. But even that, trying, we were trying to understand how how do these differences, these have changed over time. Used to be 60, 40, there used to be more sharing. Who's driving these changes in the, in the relationship? Is it the owner? Is it the crew? Because you can argue both ways at, at one level. You know, if, if fishing is bad, you know, then probably crew would prefer a, a fixed wage if the share is going to be very little. You know, but if, 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 if things are going well, then a, a good, a percentage of the share will also be good uh, for the crew. So I'm, I'm still not very clear as to who drives uh, the relationship between uh, you know, how wages are actually determined. I think it's a, a complicated process. I mean, now in Rameshwaram, sometimes they pay daily. They don't even want to give this you know, weekly karabeta, which is basically me meant to retain uh, this because they don't know when they're going to fish. You know, the fishing has become so in, uh, it's, you know, it's been affected so badly. Now, the, f the more important thing I guess you were asking is accumulation. It's very difficult, I don't know. I mean, I was asking people working in other areas, in other, you know, in labor, in industry, how do you understand something uh, like accumulation? How do you, you know, empirically uh, verify it? I mean, you can look at production data, which will tell you overall data about catch. Okay, but that is not necessarily very useful. You can get landing site data, perhaps, which will tell you how much comes in from a particular landing center. That will be at an aggregate level. I think the only way to do it is to sit down and you know, map this out with boat owners. Now, what this Johnny has tried to do that a little bit for his PhD thesis work, where he was able to access the diaries of five or six owners. And they, you know, some of these owners really keep very, very detailed notes uh, about how they spend money, what they catch, what they sell, how they sell, where they sell. So some amount of calculations can be done like that. But even that is, you know, I, I, I'm not very sure how expenditure and income data uh, translates into something like accumulation. So what we've done, tried to do on related work is to come up with like nine or 10 different indices about you know, uh, ec the basic economics of the owners. Like for example, what boat, what, what uh, uh, motor, whether they're using GPS, whether they're using these eco sounders, whether they're investing in other types of professor, there's diversification outside. 
and thing. And you know, so having a set of indicators essentially, which will give you some type of an idea as to you know, what is the overall economic position of, of people and how is that changing over time. Now whether that equals accumulation, I, I don't know. But I, I don't, don't have any real, uh, I mean, there's more work I think in the agrarian studies there, you know, like when Utsa, the JNU work on uh, accumulation in the 70s and 80s, I think has, it, it seems to be more grounded. But I haven't really seen this type of work in, in, in fisheries. So if you can help me out, I'd be welcome to. Let's do it. But it is largely this type of thing, you know, having these sets of indicators, political capital, economic capital, trying to classify owners, and seeing if you can get a temporal dimension to that, and then classifying these boats into, okay, we've, we've large, medium, and small. It's largely the large, but who we categorize as, lar categorize as large, who are crossing over more into Sri Lankan waters. The small owners generally are not. So we're doing that, the data are still being analyzed more, but maybe in a month I have a little bit better idea, but it's still something we're not totally clear about. Have you been able to study the process by which uh, the, the sale of the catch happens? And whether they are actually get able to get a, a, you know, a market-driven sort of a value? Or is, it, is that value itself is completely manipulated in a way where the actual beneficiaries of the accumulation is happening somewhere else? Yeah, that's why I sort of at the end said that you know, the, the accumulation is happening. I mean, I can tell you this from looking at seafood exporters. The accumulation is happening at the seafood export thing. But the other thing is that, yeah, again, that's the post-harvest thing is interesting. It's something we're trying to do in the next six months. Like, we, we have a broad idea of how things are sold. So you'll have, in some centers, you'll have auctioning. You'll have auctioning, you know, where you just call out. You'll have auctioning through chits. You will have traders. The most common thing seems to be like, you'll have like, in, in, the, in this area, you'll have Neela, Diamond Seafood, Poro Ashwini, five or six companies. Their agents are basically going, and they've already, this has already been decided before they come back to the sea. And, they give advances, companies might give advances, or middle, there'll be traders in between companies and the fishers who might be giving advances. So certain boats are tied up with certain traders, which are tied up with certain companies. Uh, but just by observation, I mean, we need to look at this in more detail. Like in most other sectors, but even more so, I think, in fisheries, the, it's at this end of the value chain. It's the people who like everything, the people who do the least work make the most money. <laughs> I guess that's the, uh, that's how it is here. Basically, the traders and the big companies who go to, who export this, those are where the real margins are in seafood. Yeah, because I, I, you know, uh, during this interaction itself, we came across one village, uh, where what they have done is that the village itself has taken over the auctioning activity. Which part of the? Uh, this is on the um, Manar side. Or in the, Sri Lanka? Uh, no, in, in, in our yeah. side. Okay. Towards the Vembar side, but it's a, it's a model which they they oh. thought it was more beneficial. So they have taken over the auctioning themselves as a, as a part of the village panchayat. So they give a right to auction. Is this in the Park Bay or is it uh, in the no, Gulf of Manar? No, it is in the Gulf of Manar. Gulf of Manar. Okay. So one village we come, came across on this model, and the village panchayat earned about 18 lakh rupees just by doing this uh, acti activity of uh, taking over the market. So there is a manipulation of the value associated and the accumulation is not actually equitable. Uh, in the sense that that is also a problem which is there because it, there are multiple stakeholders. The stakeholders are crew, there are stakeholders are the boat owners, the stakeholders are the traders and the small village uh, uh, you know, sellers who buy the fish on a daily basis and sell off. There are multiple stakeholders yeah, who, are, multiple. who are involved in this story, yeah. and there's a huge livelihood. Yeah, we've mapped that uh, quite a bit in the pork bay. So you'll have like local markets, you know, uh, people who buy fish and uh, with head loads, basically, yeah, head loads. they go for local markets. Then you'll have those who are tapping sort of Kerala markets a little bit, or you know, larger Tamil towns, Tamil Nadu towns, and then of course the companies who really control the export market, and they're the ones who are also dominating in the aquaculture now. You know, there are a lot of, uh, and I think our, but it's something that I, I feel, you know, we, we need people to do this type of research because it's something, there's not a lot of work on it, but 
as you said, the value. The, the that could lead to, a, to some sort of idea of who could be the stakeholders who could help devolve the crisis, or you know. Talk later. I mean, I think I would probably take from the last point, that is, uh, could you please talk a little more about the nature and the role of civil society? Because when we think about the scale jumping, I mean, where is really the civil society coming into a scene? Is it somewhere in the scale jumping activities, or is it somewhere in the marketing or in capital accumulation? So in that way, what is the role of civil society? Or even if it is helping them to, you know, whether it is dispersing the whole, uh, the sense of, okay, coming to a scene of marketing again, or uh, what is the nature? Is it political or? Yeah, I don't know, maybe Apanra will know more in other areas where I think, you know, like role of SIFs and things in the southern part of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, was much more. Here, in, 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 in this particular issue, the role of uh, civil society, as I said, was largely, of course, this group called ARIF was started, you know, Association for the Release of Innocent Fishers was, started, I mean, like even there's this, some um, dispute about, you know, whether it, it was a broad-based civil society initiative or something that emerged out of some type of funding and NGO-driven thing, but RF uh, emerged probably 20 years ago when this crisis was becoming bad and when fishers were being arrested, right, and uh, basically to help get people released from either Indian jails or Sri Lankan jails. So I think the, the that the activity w uh, in terms of this particular conflict has been largely limited to that. Of course, you know, fishers themselves have their own, you know, they have their panchayats, they, the trawler associations, there are 10 trawling associations in Rameshram, another six in Mandapam. So they discuss, you know, day-to-day -day issues about, you know, access to diesel, of course, the problems in this case of going across the Pork Bay, and you know how, how basically how to reach the state. You know how can boat associations be sort of the conduit to to get the government to you know take up issues that are important to the fishing community. So you have I mean different types of actors intervening in different ways. I mean and of course post tsunami not so much in this area. You had this burgeoning of you know post tsunami NGOs and even this whole fiberglass boat which is now you know, has taken over from the more traditional artisanal boats was really a product of the tsunami, I mean, in terms of its numbers. You know, it's, uh, so you have different types of, but again, you know, the distinction between civil society state is a little bit confused, I mean, because now this initiative, this Park Bay initiative, Vivek, who's, you know, who's based in Trivandrum, but who was with SIFs and the society, South in Society for Federation of Fishwork, you know, fish, Fishwork, fishermen societies, he's part, is part of our group that's been working. So he started a lot of these discussions about buyback and so on, but now he's working with the Tamil Nadu government, helping the Tamil Nadu government who have taken up this issue. So, you know, the, the boundary, of course, is, is blurred between civil society and state, but I think in this particular area, it's probably, you don't have as many NGOs coming into the picture as you do in other parts of Tamil Nadu with regard to fisheries. Thanks, thanks for your talk. Uh, so I don't know too much about uh, fisheries, but uh, I, I was curious about uh, your orientation to the study and your choice of method. And I was wondering uh, uh, how come you're not uh, taking the perspective of the fish in terms of, uh, I, I don't mean that in a trivial way, in, t in, in the sense of uh, sustainable yields or uh, uh, the, the resulting institutional solutions of individual quotas or total allowable catch or, or things like that, right? Because uh, uh, the dominant uh, scholarship on fisheries, it, to my uh, limited reading, has has been on institutional solutions that will treat the entire area of water as as a possible open access resource, right? And and then we'll try to come up with a set of rules that uh, will uh, protect livelihoods and protect the resource as well. So your 
political economy perspective is, is, is certainly uh, very explanatory, but I'm curious why you're not uh, looking at it from the uh, rules that will possibly, be in the long run, uh, uh, survive. Because you did mention 70 days and 83 days, which, which seem to be a sustainability-oriented institutional solution. But everything else seems to be a, a, a political, uh, rhetoric-based uh, uh, sort of uh, voice in the debate. And, and to be honest, those at the end of the day are not verifiable, right? But uh, returning to catch, uh, returning to quantity, returning to volume, uh, you, you'll have a, 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 some sort of clarity on whether someone is earning fairly or whether someone is over-harvesting. So, uh, any thoughts on why this does not feature in the Park Bay crisis? Could it feature? Uh, will we move towards an Icelandic or a New Zealand type solution? Or will we constantly be uh, talking about this island is ours, that island is theirs, things like that? Yeah. I think there are lots of, lots of questions there, so let me try to tackle them. Yeah, the, why not the fish? Someone asked us this. In, I think, uh, let me say what our, our starting point for whatever, for whatever reason, uh, was to try to uh, both understand this particular conflict and also work with civil society groups on both sides to come to some type of a resolution of, of this. And as a, as a wider sort of project team, uh, the solution that one has been trying to advocate, uh, some at least within the group, there have been differences within the group, is the idea that there is never going to be a sustainable solution with trawlers. So one has to recognize that trawlers are the problem and one needs to work towards a solution which will get them out of trawling. There are, there's some disagreement amongst us as to you know, how that should be done and whether what will be the consequences of that. But that was sort of our mandate, to try to understand this problem and then try to, in a, in a sense, resolve it. Now, in, in the process of doing that, obviously, more the research side of our team as opposed to the civil society side of, of the team, started to realize that to solve this problem, it is enmeshed in this really complicated geopolitics, you know, transboundary type of a situation. That's why I briefly did talk a, a touch about the idea of a sort of a solution to the tragedy of the commons. Uh, can you treat this, uh, let's say, treat the Pork Bay as a commons, where you have institutional arrangements and so on. And, but generally in the commons literature and what this doesn't really uh, lead to is the fact that there are such unequal actors in this commons, as long as people continue to trawl. So it'll be like heterogeneous type of collective action that one would be having to talk about. But the point that emerged while we were, our researchers, we have people working on the Sri Lankan side, the information that they're coming out with on that side is that there is no compromise uh, that people on that side want in terms of, they will talk collective action solutions, they will talk possible collective action sharing of these waters once the trawlers are out of the picture. Before that, there is no question of collective action because it will be completely unequal and basically they will be squeezed out. So I think at that level, we haven't reached that position. I think there are still people who believe that this can be in some way a, 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 common, a commons, which can be used and, you know, collectively by two sets of people in two countries. Uh, but I think they see this buyback and getting trawling out of the picture as the first step in that process. Uh, the question about, I think you started, which I think is a good question, and I, I admit part defeat here, in the sense is why didn't you follow the fish? And, and you know, this is one of the criticisms I think that most, many, so, many of us who are social scientists and call ourselves political ecologists, where is the ecology in political ecology? You know, like uh, much, of our, much of this analysis is, is, is being driven by the politics side, the social side. And, and, I, and I agree, I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, a couple of marine biologists working with us. We've been trying to do some amount of work on that side of things, both on that side and on this side. But the honest truth is that we're not really happy with what we've come up with in terms of its analytical rigor. So I don't really want to say anything more about that other than 
You know, most people in this area say that fish are rapidly declining. This is what fishers are telling you, and we believe there's no reason that they would, uh, you know, lie about this. You know, that stocks are depleting, for, especially on the Indian side. That's another reason of the, for the transboundary thing. Uh, so that's, I think, a limitation, and I think, yeah, we need to, we need to address it. Hopefully, we can over the next year or so. I think this, the, the total allowable catch, I mean, my limited understandings about fisheries economics and the total allowable catch type stuff tends to be used in temperate climates. And I don't think it is really applicable in, in our type of waters. So though those debates I think are fascinating, if you read, I don't know, in, in fisheries like this person, Becky Mansfield's work on, you know, uh, privatizing, neoliberalizing the oceans. It's really fascinating stuff about, you know, how this, you know, this total allowable catch is, is being used as an instrument of capital and things like that. But I don't, I don't think from what I've discussed with people who know much more than me on this that those type of solutions are going to be tabled because they're not really applicable in terms of the fisheries of it in terms of our waters. I don't know if I, yeah? We haven't either. Which you guys can take up at Azim Premji. Yes. With you have. Be very nice to ask you. <laughs>